thanks very much for coming, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Phil Pearson. This is his final PhD seminar. Um, and I have some notes that he kindly provided, which is really good. Uh, Phil was born and raised in Red Bay, Alabama, USA, a town with 4,500 people and 26 churches, where they enjoyed farm life and developed a love for the natural world in the forests and hills of the Cumberland Plateau. Phil earned their Bachelor of Science in Biology with Honours and Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 2013 in the process renewing their love for biological sciences. In particular, thermal influences on developmental plasticity as well as teaching grabbed Phil's attention. In 2016, Phil furthered these interests by joining Dan Warner's lab in Auburn University, also in Alabama, uh, to finish their masters in biological sciences, looking at the seasonal temperature effects on plastic performance traits in the brown anole lizard, Anolis sagrae. And it's really important you know those um, species names, by the way. So prior to arriving to Australia, Phil worked for the Alabama Natural Heritage Program as a lab manager and research technician for Dr. David Steen, working on snake behavior, impacts of large invasive lizards on native ecosystems and conservation of several endemic herpetofauna species, also um, while also being involved in their science outreach program. And Phil, obviously brought a lot of um, reptile expertise along with them. Uh, they commenced their PhD in 2018, braving field work in the wilds of Western Queensland and Central Australia, while also completing some fine laboratory experiments here on UC campus using our Pagona viticeps colony. And I think that's the, the sort of um, fundamental work that Phil's going to focus on today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Phil, but just, just to remind people who are online and welcome to you, uh, just to please make sure you mute yourself and that um, post questions at the end of the chat and we'll deal with them then. And um, I have a tutorial, so I won't be here to, um, to host the uh, question and answer session at the end. So Janine will take over at that point. Thanks very much. Welcome to Phil. Thanks, Steve. Um, as Steve said, my name is Phil Pearson, uh, pronouns are them, um, and occasionally he. Uh, but this is my uh, pre-submission seminar, final seminar um, for my thesis. So I am titled it, Does Sex Reversal Affect um, Reproduction in Offspring Phenotypes in the Central Bearded Dragon? So first, I want to start out by um, acknowledging uh, all the people that I've worked with, and first and foremost, the uh, Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land that we are sitting on, um, and the um, all other First Nations peoples whose lands I've utilized uh, in my research, um, as well as my supervisory panel, uh, Steve Sar, uh, Lisa Schwanz and Janine Deacon, um, and uh, several other people, but specifically Claire Halili and Jackie Richardson. Uh, Claire has been a tremendous help in some of this the work um, and the, the former work that was done with these species. And Jackie has just been amazing in helping me um, with all the colony animals. And of course, Chris Wild too. Um, he's the absolute best. Um, so just want to start from the beginning here um, and some of the underlying fundamentals of um, my studies, which is sex determination. And so what determines sex? So we have here this complex tree of life um, looking at eukaryotic species. And you can see there's quite a few different ways that sex can be determined. Um, so what does this matter? How does this affect other things that are going on in, a, uh, in individual species? Um, and can there be transitions between those? So drawing some attention to um, the reptilia, there's quite a bit going on there. There's not just a single um, way that sex can be determined in uh, that whole clade. Um, so first we'll start th and think about the, um, what, we, what we typically think about with sex determination, which is uh, genetic sex determination. So 
individuals having sex chromosomes. So males having um, a, set, a certain set of chromosomes and females having a different set of chromosomes. And there being genes on those chromosomes that determine the sex. Um, so that can be in a few different ways. So we have the male heterogeneity. So that is the typical um, human and mammalian uh, sex determining system where we have XX and XY. So XX males, or excuse me, XX females and XY males. So um, there are other ways too. Uh, so birds are a little bit different. So we have heter female heterogeneity um, in, the, in birds and many reptiles. So that is ZZ males uh, and ZW females. And within these, we have these sex determining genes. Um, and there's use, some cases there are, are uh, master sex determining genes, like we know with uh, the SRY gene, which is the sex determining region on the Y, um, and DMRT1, uh, which is sex determining gene in uh, chickens. All right. But there can also be polygenic control, where you have multiple genes controlling the, uh, the determination of the sex of the individual. So the next thing we would think about um, is environmental sex determination. So we usually think that oh, sex is just determined by chromosomes, but the environment can actually have a major effect on uh, the sex of an individual. And in fact, some species are strictly uh, temperature dependent uh, or strictly environmental dependent on their, their sex. Uh, so this is caused by many factors, usually abiotic factors, but it can be social cues as well. Um, hormonal cues and even pollutants can um, drive the environmental sex determination. Um, but I want to focus more so on temperature dependent sex determination as that's what's most commonly found in reptiles. Um, so we have here um, just a, a figure of three different species and three different modes of, of temperature dependent sex determination. Um, so we have temperature increasing on the X and percentage of male uh, sex ratios on the Y. So you can see different species can do that in different ways. But um, it's not always the case for those two dichotomous, um, two dichotomous things. So we have genetic and environmental, but there's some overlap in some species. So it's more of a continuum or spectrum rather than just those two set in stone ways. Um, so we have some species that can have actually multiple modes of sex determination in a single population. Um, and this is often due to environmental factors that can override those sex uh, determining genes um, that are on their sex chromosomes. For example, uh, with this frog species here, this is the agile frog, they have um, a masculinization due to pollutants in um, urbanized areas. So you have XX males occurring. Um, in this Madaka fish, the rice fish here, um, you have a temperature override in their system where um, extreme temperatures can produce XX males. So what this means is that there are often more than three sexes and um, three or more sexes in these populations. So there can be intermediates and we don't know too much about these intermediates or um, sex reverse individuals. Um, so like I said, they don't know the consequences of this um, either. And if there's an advantage being sex reverse, a disadvantage, so on and so forth. So what are the implications of sex reversal? So we have potentially skewed sex ratios um, and that may increase the chance of reversal um, in populations. So if um, there are more, um, more females that are um, uh, sex reverse females that are reversed by temperatures um, and temperatures are warming, you may get skewed, uh, a skewed ratio there. Uh, there are also transitions that may lead to those complete switch of modes of determination. And I'll give you a little cartoon example of that, of how that could happen in just a minute. Um, and ways these transitions could like could lead in changes of, of mode of sex determination as usually due to fitness related uh, traits of those sex reverse individuals. So are they more, more fecund? Do they have differing behaviors than um, their concordant counterparts? Um, are there morphological or performance differences that could then um, influence and make them outcompete those concordant individuals? Um, so 
there may be those advantages to being sex reversed. However, um, if you are induced, uh, sex, is, um, sex reversal is induced by temperature, but doesn't necessarily have a um, advantage. Shifting uh, extreme climate shifts can still push these towards um, this transition of sex of sex determination, uh, regardless of the sex reverse being fit, more fit or not. So, just as an example, we start here. We have um, a population that is GSD and it is female heterogametic. So we have ZZ males breeding with ZW females. Um, and in the next generation, during development, a climactic event happens. There's more a hotter year or something like that. Um, and that produces a mixed system. So you then have um, males breeding with um, sex reverse females and concordant females. So ZZ females are produced. Um, but there could be things that the ZZ females, they may be more attractive, may, um, may be more fit, and the males might choose them over the ZW females. So this is how transitions can occur in these populations. So this goes from a mixed population to being more of a TSD population. Um, and as these, as these TSD individuals uh, continue to reproduce, um, you begin to shift towards uh, the loss of that ZW those ZW individuals in the W chromosome. So that leads to potentially a pure TSD system and the complete loss of a, a chromosome. So really big implications of how this can affect the evolution of sex determination, right? Um, and this is where I can insert my study species here, which is the central bearded dragon, Pagona viticeps. So this is a widespread agamid lizard that is native to uh, central arid zones of Australia. Um, so this is a TS, or excuse me, a GSD species that we know. So they have um, ZZ and ZW chromosomes. So that's female heterogamity. Um, and as we go through the talk, just to point out, I'll be referring to males as ZZ males and concordant females as ZW females. So ZZM, ZZF, All right? Um, but we also know that sex reversal occurs in these systems or in this system. So that sex reversal is induced by higher incubation temperatures. Um, so as you increase in temperature, you have a more, a higher rate of reversal of these individuals producing these sex reversed um, ZZ females, which are ZZF. So throughout the talk, sex reverse is ZZF. All right. Um, so we first need to make sure that an individual, we can determine that um, an individual is sex reversed. So we need to first look at the phenotypic sex. So we can do this in a few ways, depending on the age of the individual. Um, so here we have, it's kind of hard to see, but there is a uh, back, there's a light shining through the, the tail of a hatchling dragon. And those arrows are pointing to uh, blood flow to the genitalia. So that is a male individual. Um, so that's trans, um, the penile trans um, And then you look at the adults, you can see bumps of the genitalia um, or extrude the genitalia for sure. Um, gravidity is another great way to tell if um, a, individual is female or not. So gravidity meaning that they have um, eggs within their body cavity. Um, so once we, we know the phenotypic sex of the individual, uh, we can uh, use genetic markers uh, that were developed um, by researchers here um, to show the Z and W chromosomes via just a simple PCR test. Um, and we do uh, direct your, your um, attention to the image on the far right. Um, so the arrows are pointing to this top band. Those top bands are all the Zs. So that's a control. Um, so if an individual is a ZZ, it will only have one band. Um, however, if it's a ZW, it will have this second band. And that second band is, again, just showing the W chromosome. Um, so uh, we then are able to um, look at the phenotype and the genotype at the same time and determine if an individual is indeed sex reverse. All right, so what we know about these sex reverse individuals so far has been from a several, several studies through the, through the years, um, most of which have actually happened here at UC. 
Um, so back in 2005, Halili et al. published the paper um, showing that um, ZZ females of similar age have higher fecundity. So they're laying more eggs uh, per season and that they also have this higher propensity for sex reversal. So as we look at this figure here, we have incubation, incubation temperature increasing on the x-axis and on the y we have rate of reversal. So the rate of individuals that are changing from uh, ZZ male to ZZ female. Uh, the red line is ZZ female offspring and the black line is ZW female offspring. So you can see the shift in the pivotal temperature at 50, where 50% 50 of the individuals uh, start to sex reverse. Uh, it's shifted um, to a little bit cooler temperatures for those sex reversed mother or the offspring of sex reversed mothers. So it's a really important finding and means that these individuals so if they're having higher fecundity, they can uh, produce more offspring in, the, in a lifetime and potentially aid in that transition towards um, a TSD um, system. Because within this single system, um, as they've uh, mated uh, or reproduced, you have a ZZ female, all of her offspring are going to um, be temperature dependent sex determination because they no longer have that W chromosome. So another paper, another study showed that um, the juveniles of this species of the sex reversed actually behave more like males. So they have these male-like traits associated with aggression and boldness. Um, so that's some more implications showing that, okay, if this is a bit of a fitness trait, if they're laying more eggs and their offspring are um, behaving differently, they may be able to expand the range or outcompete their concordant counterparts. Um, and, and then there's actually another paper showing there's a little bit of similarities between at least the adults. So the, there's a paper showing that bite force, um, there's no difference in bite force between ZW females and ZZ females, right? Um, and as I mentioned, um, or if I didn't mention, well now that sex reversal actually occurs in the wild as well. So that's not just a laboratory um, thing that happened. And we actually have found sex reverse individuals out in the field, quite a few actually. Um, but it does occur within this small range. Small is um, about a quarter of their, of their range. But that's actually probably the size of some small countries. Um, but it's a, at a rate of about 12%. Um, so again, it's isolated to that, seemingly isolated to that, to that range. Um, and it's been theorized by Castelli et al. that it's more of a genetic threshold that's preventing these transitions from T, uh, TSD, or excuse me, from GSD to TSD. So that those localized adaptations um, in those hotter regions like the Northern Territory that are significantly hotter throughout the year uh, than the southeastern area. So the sex reversal isn't happening there though. So there's some sort of local adaptations that are happening with it. Um, and then Chris recently published some people, uh, published some work uh, from his thesis um, showing that localized areas of sex reversal have this, uh, rather than transitioning towards a TSD system, um, it's becoming just an evolutionary, um, evolutionarily stable in small populations. So you just have populations that have ZZ and then they're not really, um, not really an advantage. However, we also know um, from some theoretical work uh, done by Lisa Schwanz at all um, that even in one for, even in a population with these, uh, with sex reversal, if there's just a little bit of immigration within a, of ZW females within one generation, it can buffer that loss of, of uh, that W chromosome. Uh, so how does this tie back with everything else? So we, we are trying to understand these transitions in sex determination and how, how um, sex reversed females might be inducing traits that may um, increase the or promote sex reversal throughout um, their populations. 
So that brings in more of the questions that I'm, I'm interested in. Those are traits that could promote transitions in the sex determining systems. So as we saw with Holly et al, 2015 paper, these, these females have um, higher fecundity. So sex reversal has, uh, is laying nearly twice as many eggs um, as concordant females. And Lee showed that they are exhibiting some traits that are potentially making more fit offspring. But I want to understand, we're trying to understand, are there more fitness related traits uh, that could be affected by sex reversal? And then um, finally, their ability to spread. So if they have these fitness related traits, they may be able to spread to other um, areas, right? So as I said, Caselli suggested this localized threshold, um, but there could be other factors um, that are affecting this, such as ne altered nesting behaviors. And if those nesting behaviors are altered, could it increase um, the rate of reversal? Uh, so again, narrowing it a little down, narrowing it in a little more to some of the studies that I've done, offspring advantage may imply a maternal advantage, all right? So we least showed those male-like behaviors could increase fitness, um, but we don't really know anything about the other fitness related phenotypes. And I found my other typo that I couldn't find earlier, apologies. So fitness related phenotypes need to be measured to gain a better understanding um, if there's differences there. And to do so, we actually will, I actually had to revisit um, the Holloway et al. 2015 study by proxy, just because I needed to produce a bunch of eggs uh, to look at offspring, um, offspring fitness. Okay, so with that, I was able to bolster the amount of sample size and then potentially confirm their findings. Um, so first question, I guess, with this, with this topic is, so do sex reverse animals have higher reproductive output uh, compared to their concordant counterparts? Halili et al. provides evidence for this, but that's actually quite a small sample size in that study, right? And with this, uh, with my study, I aim to um, determine if sex reversal actually does provide a potential fecundity fitness or fitness advantage over those concordant um, mothers, and then exp by expanding upon Holloway's paper. So just a bit of a breeding design. Sorry for that. It's been censored out. Um, so we started off with uh, the UC colony. Uh, so I have uh, breeding pairs, uh, or excuse me, breeding trios. Of ZZ, ZW mothers uh, paired with the ZZ father. And then we have ZZ mothers paired with a ZZ father. And then we took eggs from them um, and then randomly allocated them to one of two incubation temperatures, 28 or 34 degrees. Um, and those temperatures were chosen because 28 degrees produces, is the um, lower than the threshold for producing any sex reversal, uh, and 34 degrees produces a mixed bag for sex reversal um, with the ZW and ZZ. All right, so same with the ZZ, 28 degree incubation and 34 degree. And this was over two, uh, two reproductive years um, and about 56 females um, were used in this. All right, so of those 56, only half of those females actually laid. So looking at this figure here, um, I wanted to understand, make sure that reprodu reproductive capability wasn't um, inhibited or promoted by sex reversal. Um, and I found that there was no difference. So this is just showing uh, maternal genotype on the X and on the Y is the probability that they would reproduce in a year or within the seasons. Uh, no difference there. Um, so then looking at total X um, and the rate of clutches. So I found that ZW females produce 1.57 times, 1.75 times more viable eggs uh, than ZZ females. So this is contrary to what I was expecting for sure. Uh, so you can see uh, quite a few more eggs. Again, ZW females on the X, or excuse me, maternal genotype on the X, rate of reproduction on the Y. And this is using uh, estimated marginal means uh, to create these figures, right? So they produced more eggs. Um, ZW females also produced 1.63 more clutches uh, in my two seasons than 
said said females did. Um, furthermore, they ZWF, ZW females um, produced 7.8 more eggs per clutch than ZZ females. Again, not what I was expecting. Um, and we also have to look um, outside of just the total number of eggs and things like that. We need to look at hatchling success too. Uh, so I didn't find that there were well, 75 about 75% of all my eggs hatched, um, but I didn't find a difference between maternal genotypes. So the maternal genotypes aren't affecting whether or not a, a offspring will hatch. Okay? Um, but the major thing was uh, that larger eggs uh, had a 33.33%, excuse me, 3.33 times higher chance of hatching than smaller eggs. All right, so my results from my study. So I showed that ZW females actually produce more viable eggs, more clutches, and more eggs per clutch, which is contradictory to what Holly et al. Uh, 2015 found, All right? So they found that ZZ females actually produce twice as many eggs. So what's going on here? I needed to, to get a better understanding of what the, my females that I was using. So revisiting the data and chatting with my supervisors and Claire as well um, on this. So Claire's in the loop, uh, Claire Halele is on, in the loop on this uh, as well. So I needed to see if there's some sort of like mysterious underlying colony effect that we've produced um, through years of captive breeding, because it's been uh, a decade since those, uh, that data was produced. So I looked at wild caught versus captive breeding um, and the effects of captive breeding in itself. So with that I needed to construct a pedigree so to take all of the individuals back to wild caught, which was a lot of scouring handwritten notes and all of these things date going back to 2003 actually to get some of these individuals and get a, the best understanding of the of these of these data and the females that I was using. Um, so determined also through this pedigree, um, I determined inbreeding coefficients. So the inbreeding coefficient uh, is just showing how inbred an individual is, um, and that inbreeding can cause various deleterious effects or um, uh, that could affect reproduction. Uh, generation and captivity. So that's just looking at how far away or how long they've been domesticated. And we could be subconsciously um, biasing our reproductive efforts by um, selecting females that are actually just more, that are producing more eggs every year. So um, we might have biased our um, selection through the generations. Um, and then looking at maternal age as well and determining if there's differences, because in many other animals, there's differences um, in size and with age, they may increase and then decrease in reproduction. However, uh, well, first looking at, however, there's a giant pedigree. Uh, this horrifying thing um, that I created takes all of those um, emails that I used back to wild caught. Um, and it just shows how much can be going on, could potentially be going on um, in a colony, right, over the years. So there's lots of time and in inter in intermixing with, that, with things that could influence back, um, variables that could influence re reproduction. So what did I find? There was no effect of wild caught versus captive bred in my, in my study um, with inbreeding coefficient, no effect. Generation of captivity, no effect. Maternal age class, no effect. So the plot thickens. What? What happened? What now? Um, so I contacted Claire and Claire Halili and chatted with her about the data, and she provided me the data and told me to look at that data and then look at the the subsequent years following. Um, so I reanalyzed the data and found that one she had they had a. Um, smaller sample size, so only 17 individuals. Um, and that, yes, would analyze that way. They have um, ZZ produced 2.83 more eggs um, over those two seasons 
than ZWP mouse did. And they also average more eggs per clutch, more clutches per year. Um, but then I looked at it those subsequent years, like, I, like they suggested. Um, so this is showing um, maternal genotype again on the, on the X, and then the average rate of egg production over from 2011 to 2019. And we see this shift that looks more like my data, right? Um, so we have ZW females producing 1.15 more eggs than ZZ females. Um, and ZW females like more eggs per clutch, and, but there is no difference in the amount of clutches between uh, the two. Um, and that just, and just to visualize the, the reproductive years, you can see um, this is the uh, paper from 2015, looking at these two years. So we have 2011-12 um, only having ZZ um, offspring, or excuse me, eggs from ZZ females. Uh, we're, and then 2013-14 had ZW and ZZ females. Uh, but there was a dramatically more eggs in 2011. Um, so what's going on there, right? Um, so again, after chatting with Claire about this, discuss this um, star female that they had within this, um, within this study. So they had a relatively low, again, low sample size. And when you include that star female who laid 105 eggs and five clutches or over five clutches uh, in a single reproductive season, um, you have this uh, ZZ's producing more than ZW, right? However, if you remove her from the um, study, you wind up with the opposite. So it may just be that there was a outlier female that's just super rock star that one year um, that produced so many eggs and drove this, uh, uh, drove these numbers differently than, than what we would normally expect. Um, so I wanted to then, put my data in with this trend and see if it's still matched. And um, as you look on the far right, I have my two years and they, they do match the same trend as uh, the previous years minus the 2011. So what can we conclude um, from, from this study? Uh, so ZW females produce more eggs uh, per season than ZZ females. And then this is again, um, uh, contradictory to the previous studies, um, but it does seem to be caused by that outlier female that produced all of those eggs. Uh, but subsequent study or subsequent years uh, match the findings that I found. Um, so from this, we can kind of say that sex reversal doesn't necessarily provide a fecundity advantage but might actually be disadvantageous because they are producing less eggs, excuse me, fewer eggs. Um, and the spread of the transition of, of sex determining mode um, may actually be impeded by this disadvantage. Right. So we have this idea, this brought about the ideas with higher fecundity and we have a better understanding that, okay, it's not as what we thought previously thought. Um, so then I wanted to dive into the aspects of offspring and looking at um, the things that Lee paper uh, implied. So focusing on that part. And looking at, again, the consequences of sex reversal on offspring fitness. So does sex reversal affect phenotypic traits in the early on ontological stages? So after hatching and growth and things like that? Are there different phenotypic traits that could um, improve the fitness of those individuals? So we aimed to first determine if there are morphological differences between um, the genotypes, the uh, offspring of the two maternal genotypes, then determine if those offspring genotypes um, excuse me, their own genotypes affect those traits as well. So the offspring's individual genotype that affects it. Um, and then determine if incubation temperature also influences these traits as we, um, as 
previous studies in various other reptiles have shown that incubation temperature influences uh, a suite of, of morphological and fitness traits. Uh, and then determine if there are performance differences between the offspring of both genotypes. But I'm going to focus more so on these first three today, just for brevity. Um, so bringing us back to that breeding design that we saw earlier. So this is taking those same eggs that I used for that study and then carrying them through to the to offspring stage. So we had, again, ZZ fathers and ZZ mothers um, producing eggs um, and incubated at 28 and 34, that will produce um, many different maternal genotype, offspring genotype, sex, offspring sex, and um, incubation temperature mishmash, which is very confusing and causes a lot of statistical pain. Um, but so we have two groups from ZW mothers at 28 degrees, ZW and Z, ZW females and ZZ males. And then we have three groups at 34, ZW females, ZZ females, and ZZ males. And then with ZZ mothers at 28, of course, we would have only um, ZZ males. And then at 34, we have ZZ females and ZZ males. Um, so looking at the hatchling morphology and growth over time, and the cute little baby lizards um, sticking his little head out of, it, of his egg there. Um, so I measured a heap, a whole heap of um, hatchlings and looked at various morphometrics that can be associated with performance traits and fitness, such as snout vent length, tail length, mass, hind limb length, body condition. Um, and then I looked at this immediately after hatching and at five to seven weeks, <coughs> excuse me, and then at 10 to 12 weeks. Um, so I'm not going to bombard you with all of the slides of all of this data, but just the key, some key points that I found um, with hatchling morphology and growth. So at the time of hatching, um, offspring from ZZ mothers um, were significantly longer and had better body condition and marginally longer tails. So that's just where representative of this figure here. Again, we have maternal genotype on the X and on the Y. In the top panel, we have snout vent length and on the bottom panel, we have body condition. Um, looking at the top, we, uh, top panel, you can see that um, ZZ females produced um, those larger or longer. So snout vent length is the tip of the nose to, to their vent. Um, so longer bodies, um, which could mean that they have um, longer bodies and, and larger um, selves to, to be faster or outcompete their um, uh, other hatchling hatchmates. So then looking at body condition. So body condition is the um, residuals from a linear regression of um, snout vent length and mass. So we take those residuals, if you have a positive, um, you are heavy for your length. If you have a negative, you're skinny for your length, right? So we see that ZZ females produced um, offspring that had a positive, so they were heavier for their length, right? And then ZW females had um, a mostly negative, so they were skinny for their length. But also there are, again, other factors that I was looking at. So warmer incubation temperatures produced shorter, um, shorter hatchlings with longer tails and marginally better body condition. So not too much going on with that. Um, sorry. But that's essentially what I found with, with hatchling morphology. There's not, not a whole lot of differences, but just these two key ones. So after looking at those suite of traits, there's not really any differences in any of those other traits. Um, so then looking at growth. Um, so over time, we, as I said, I measured, uh, measured them at five to seven and 10 to 12 weeks. And I'd found no influence of uh, maternal genotype on survival to five or 10 weeks, those two, two timeframes. 
Um, and then no influence of maternal genotype on the morphometrics over time, no significant influence. Um, and temperature did influence growth at five weeks, but not at 10 weeks. So if we think back real quick, warmer temperatures produce shorter hatchlings. Um, the warmer temperatures um, or grew a little bit faster at the five, to the five week marks. So they compensated at that, at that time. Um, and then this figure is just to show they do indeed grow over time, but there's not really any difference between these groups. Um, so we have the three uh, times that I measured them um, and the colors uh, represent the genotypic sex of the offspring. And then the shape is the genotypic sex of the maternal, of the mother. Um, and that split over um, 28 degrees and 34 degrees. Um, and then this is the average snout vent length. So as you can see, they grow over time as you'd expect. Um, but again, not really any statistic, statistical significance. Sorry for the lack of error bars on this one. Um, but there is no statistical significance between those. So results from this, from this study on growth and morphology. So hatchling morphology is influenced by maternal genotype. So they're producing those larger or longer individuals with better body condition. Um, but individual genotype doesn't have uh, influence on their morphology. Um, and these effects of hatching morphology dissipate over time. So they all become more homogenous in the same size after about five weeks. So again, incubation temperature influences um, hatchling size, uh, but, not, but has little influence on growth, just that little bit of comp compensatory growth between hatchling and five, five weeks where they catch up. Um, and that's truly uh, the gist of, of the, the morphology. So not a lot going on with that. Uh, but there's a few things that you can pull from this that, that could be lead towards those transitions in, in sex determining modes. So if, if ZZ females are producing offspring that have a slight size advantage, they could give, that could mean that they have a competitive edge over the um, Z, offspring of ZW females, right? So you have a little bit of a head start and other many studies have shown that earlier hatching and, and those head starts of things can um, give you an, an, an advantage over um, later, later produced offspring and um, give you that the, the disadvantage. Uh, so again, temperature can play a key role in plastic traits and may have further influence on some of the other traits that we've thought about. So just citing myself here. So my, my honors and my masters, I looked at things like this. So how temperature could play a role on morphology. Um, so temperature, at least in the anoles, um, increase, or sorry, produce smaller hatchlings um, and larger, ha heavier hatchlings. Um, and that could then influence um, the, the fitness of an individual rather than genotype. But again, these effects are dissipating um, after over those 10 weeks. So we have this potential early um, advantage, but you don't really see how it goes. Or it doesn't seem to, to carry over. So some further works that need to be developed that I have done um, and, and are following up, but again, don't have time today, um, was looking at performance trials and whether sexual reversal influences sprint speed um, and thermal performance curves. Uh, so I raced a bunch of lizards and all of these hatchlings and um, uh, to see these uh, performance traits uh, zoomed away. Um, this hours and day, months and months of that. Um, and then I looked at thermal limits as well and whether or not sex reversal can influence these offspring thermal limits. Um, and then nest site selection, tried to look at that. Mm, lots of field data and sad things happened. Uh, droughts and COVID and droughts and floods and COVID and droughts. Um, so in, in with this, I was wanting to look at if potential nesting areas at least can then influence sex reversal at varied times of year, at varied times of the year and reproductive season. It turns out again, females are really elusive as Chris's studies have shown um, and uh, it's hard to, hard to catch those. Um, so also furthermore, looking at egg nutrient allocation and whether these mothers are allocating more resource, resources differently 
And then if hormones are different between those sex reverse females and males and concordant females, and then potentially looking at the, um, the allocation of hormones to their eggs. So overall, with what I've talked about today, um, I've shown that sex reversal doesn't necessarily convey this reproductive advantage that we uh, previously thought. Um, so as again said, Halili et al. showed that sex reverse individuals um, produce twice as many eggs, um, but in fact, they, uh, it's pretty much the opposite trend. Um, so it might actually be disadvantageous to be sex reverse. Um, so this shows how, um, this shows could, typos. This shows that there could be a factor as to, as to why or, um, TSD populations are relatively low, right? So there's, again, about 12% um, in the population um, of sex reverse individuals. And it could be that they're not able to reproduce um, and um, have as many offspring and spread the way we thought they could. So that could be a factor of that. And then sex reverse females also have that. They, so those things are, are kind of contradictory to what we previously thought, but we do still see that sex reversal can give some advantages, may or may give some advantages to their offspring um, by giving them a, a little bit a longer body size, a better body condition at hatching. Um, so that can again give a competitive edge against their um, concordant counterparts. So that might be able to let these persist in the wild. Um, however, we did also find that individual genotype phenotype combination. So the, the hatchlings themselves, their genotypes doesn't influence their morphology. Um, the, and that though there is an advantage from the start for the ZZ females, um, their counterparts compensate within a few weeks. So they just catch, they catch up uh, quite quickly. But it is important to, to note that those first few weeks is, would be when they're most likely to be snatched up by a bird, tasty little, tasty little snack um, for a magpie or any other little bird. Um, so that's basically all I have. I wanted to again not acknowledge um, my supervisory panel, Steve, Lisa, and Janine, also Claire, who has helped a lot with this. Um, Jackie, Chris, Emily, Matt, Bia, you three have been great and helped me out a lot. Um, all the IE staff and academics, and then um, all the other HCR students who've kind of become my family as I've moved from 15,000 kilometers away. Um, all the people within Team Pagona, particularly Megan and Sarah, who helped me with the genetic side of things, um, and the numerous volunteers I've had in the field, and also rock star Barbara Harris, who without Barbara, I would have had nothing would have been able to get done through the logistical nightmare that is often the um, admin side of things. And as well, um, my family and my friends back home who have been very supportive for me moving so far away um, and being gone for so long, as well as my lovely fiance, Will South, and our little puppy, Miles. Um, with that, I will take any questions. Yes. Right. So that would be, it's just a shift in the graph. So those are estimated, um, estimated marginal means from a linear mixed effects model. So it would have shifted that a bit as that, as that um, level was removed. Burn. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm just, and I'm not saying that you need to convince some February to do something like take out one in each year and take out all of them and show me there's only one slip 
And in this case, in the other one, still, if it can come out, you kind of check that approach and then you. Absolutely. Me that you Absolutely. That's a great point. And I definitely can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Will. Yes. Uh, just thinking, because it's clearly that these um, sexual aggressive females can use lots and lots and lots of mm. Because you have a response. Over the years, it was one of the new superstars. Right. So it's physiologically possible. That. So I was just wondering, so if you've got these sexual aggressive females out in the wild, and if it's evolutionary advantage to use lots of eggs, which is not necessarily an advantage to it's wild, but if that is an evolutionary advantage, would it be sexual reversal female sexual aggressive females evolved to produce more eggs uh, over time? I think that that I, I'm trying to follow that. So um, if it is an advantage and they are producing them as it, as we progress over time, continuing, not necessarily just now, but as we continue, they should continue to produce more eggs. Um, potentially. Yes. Yeah. So it would be, it should be advantage, have an advantage to have more eggs because you would have more eggs just because you have more eggs. Doesn't mean that they will all hatch, but they may have a better chance. Um, if you have more eggs, there's more chance of at least one surviving. Right. Or it would depend. Some there might be a trade off between the number of eggs you produce and the quality of those eggs. Exactly. Size, survival, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. So that's sort of what I was saying with like, there's, there is that little bit, maybe a trade-off there. Like you're not actually producing as many eggs, but you do produce offspring that are a little bit larger. Um, so they have a little bit of an advantage, um, but it still would take time for that, for those to then spread and lead to a transition in, in the turning mechanisms. Is there like um, behavioral things that people in wild animals can do to It's really hard to say, but with, with what Chris has found is that they um, they act more like females in, in at least their home range, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. And Chris, I'm sure, is online and can correct me if I'm wrong. But the um, ZZ females are more like ZW females in those behaviors. Um, but the sample size was quite low in, the, in those wild populations. And in looking at the behavior, it was difficult to look in at... Um, like aggressive behaviors or anything like that because they're um they've had very very few i think about three or four sex reverse in, in our in our population oh. oh sorry oh so david who's a former lab mate of mine um under sex reversal temperatures how um how do you think the fitness of males compares to sex reverse females? Um, I don't think at, at least early ontological phases, stages, there was any difference um, at that, at this point. So, and just looking at those, that was what I was meaning with the individual, individual genotype phenotype combination, there was no difference between um, those, um, those combinations, right? So the offsprings, individual sex and genotype didn't affect their um, morphology. Jen? Uh, so you said that about 75% of all the eggs hatched yes. in your clutches. Yep. Did you look at if that was affected at all by incubation temperatures or was that not? Um, it was more so uh, marginal, in, marginal on um, incubation temperature. Um, uh, 34 degrees had slightly less um, probability of hatching, um, but the major factor was the egg mass. So, yes. um, so you said that the sexual effect of the fitness of the on a larger scale in terms of population, when there's environmental adaptogenic genes, the sexual adaptogenic 
Would that be happening simply because of the that disturbance in the environment or whatnot? It's simply advantageous to have more visits, which means having more females in prison, or in addition, it's in the redistributes the number of which individuals can be used to each individual on a population level rather than individual as well. Right. Um, I think I'm. I think I'm following that. So it's kind of like um, if the in the if the environment is suitable. So it kind of follows like this the Charnock Bull model of that incubation temperature um, will produce the sex. Sex produced at a particular temperature will increase the fitness of that um, of that sex, um, which could be the case. And I'm not sure about. With the populations I'm trying to. Uh, I guess what I'm getting at is, is it potentially um, complicated to find these individual advantages when the advantage is rather to the population when you have a greater. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I agree that that um, probably would be a better drive, like better driver, but unfortunately, we didn't have. Capability to look at all of these things and over a pop, yeah, very expensive and time consuming, trying and, and very difficult to find these lizards. Mm. Um, the DFR data um, sure. Um, yep. Um, Okay. Um, yep. Is that like what would cause that like similar trend? Even though I guess there would be like there would be like a gender kind of difference, like um, sex discrimination with uh, gender. Um. So let me see what I'm following real quick. Um. So make things easier. <laughs> um. And. Go back to sorry. Um, well, how do I, I don't know how to reshare the thing. Um, I would. It didn't. Um, so you're saying that if this follows the same, like these are following the same trends, um, right? This overall kind of increase, and it could be sample size through the years, selecting different ways. But um, I, in in my models, I at least accounted for those years and and the things, but I didn't I didn't account for incubation temperature. So these are just um, total number of eggs produced between those two maternal genotypes over those seasons. Like getting up. I'm sorry, I was sure if I was following the correct, uh, the yeah, full so question. Does that mean that like there isn't any other extensive that could be making it, like making the algorithm of the genotype, like both genotypes have that, like all of that parallel kind of thing? There very well could be. And I just haven't looked in, into that as well as one of those. Do I want to take an even deeper dive into um, what's going on in? in previous years, and I think it was beyond the scope. It was just looking at these, finding the similar trend, this similar trend, even because within my within my study, looking at those types of things that could influence it, they didn't. So 